we're finally back at Death or Glory with author, tour manager, Del James, and my good friend Ricky Warwick from Black Star Riders, Thin Lizzy, and The Almighty. I remember we got asked to play the, the Cat Club. The Cat House. Cat House. Cat House. Sorry, Cat Club's Cat in New York, right? And um, I think we we're the first European band to do so, and this was around about, must have been 89, 90. And I think that's when I met you for the first time. You, you came down to interview. It was all it was all that same week. It was all the same week. You guys were out here. We did yeah. the, the, the magazine article. You played the Cat House. I did the the video magazine thing that covered it, which was either Metalhead or Hard and Heavy, one right. of those. Right. And and they shot you for that. And I was doing what you're doing, being the the, the interviewer guy. And. Uh, and yeah, it was always just this, this this long hair, sweaty, oozing booze, you know, shit falling out of your pockets. And it was, it was 1988, 1987. In L.A. In, in Hollywood, yeah. you know, where, where, yeah. where you know, you, you, could see, you could see Mother Love Bone and the Dogs de Moore on a bill together. You know what I mean? Like... You could see Guns N' Roses and Lord's New Church on a bill together, and it was just this yeah. this great thing. And it was kind of back to the L.A. punk rock thing that happened when you could see Los Lobos, X, and um, the Plimsolls all yeah. on a bill. It was just like anything goes. It was, it was well, super we, cool. You, know, you take four guys like the Almighty from Straven, west of Scotland, middle of bumfuck nowhere, this little industrial village where, you know, the young farmers dancing on a Saturday night was the most exciting thing you'd ever seen. And you give us the keys to Hollywood, <laughs> you know. We, we, You're we lucky to be alive. It. You know, we were just like, <laughs> that, it does exist. It's everything we ever read about and heard about and, and more. And but I, we went out every night, mm -hmm. got drunk, yeah, how had a great that? time. <laughs> it's like how, yeah, but no. now you look at Hollywood, it's all about money and cars and, you know, yeah. bottle service and, and all sure. that crap. And I'm like, is everyone just going into massive debt to be on that scene? Because when we were doing it, we all had friends that were bartenders and we had friends, and yeah. like, you'd go out with five bucks in your pocket and come home wrecked. Have a great night, yeah. And just, it yeah. was the time but, of our but, lives. But, but, the, the, stand, the, the bar was much lower. <laughs> yes, that's you true. Know? <laughs> you, you, you weren't opposed to getting pop off vodka and that that gallon of orange drink and that was vodka orange <laughs> that you drank before you went out so you were already yeah. kind of fucked up before you hit Absolutely. the door you knew the doorman you knew the bartender and if you were in a band or you know had any sort of game that that you know there was girls back then who liked rock guys you know and and, and, and like this, to take care of rock guys. And in this dysfunctional scene, you know, the more fucked up you were, the more alluring you were. So everybody was <laughs> trying to be Johnny Thunders, you know? Right. Everybody yeah. was trying to be the guy, you know? How long have you been wearing those clothes, you know? What, 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 why is your nose always bleeding? I mean... <laughs> Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Will you buy me a drink? Sure. <laughs> there was that goofy hair element that, that a lot of people mistake for what the 80s were. And then there was this, this street level thing where everybody was trying to be the Stones, trying to be Aerosmith, trying to be Hanoi. Um, and, and those were the bands of substance, you know right. what I mean? That They may not have sold as many records as Warrant, but they were so much fucking cooler. Absolutely. You know? Like the Hangmen and the Nymphs and that whole, you know, and Jane's Addiction mm -hmm. was coming up at that time. It was kind of funny because we were, you know, we'd get off the plane and I guess we'd see it from a completely different perspective and without sort of sounding arrogant, it was almost funny to us, some of it, the whole scene. Well, some just of it being, was. being from where we were from and having nothing like it, and you know, we're like, look at these guys, you know, they stay them with bitching about stuff, and you know, and and I think that worked in our favour because obviously we were the drunken, rough, hard Scotch Irish guys coming into town, and you know, everybody loved the accents and all that kind of stuff, and you no, know, that that for for me um, added to the magic of the whole thing as well. You know, it's kind of like you go off the plane, you met up with Dell, and you know, you just 
you'd immerse yourself for a week of just madness, and then you could leave again. You could get out of there. Yeah. You know? Because you kind of had to. Yeah. We didn't have but, to. But where this was one level of madness, your madness was universal. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. The Almighty, regardless of what it did in the States, was on who knows how many Iron Maiden tours. There's a mm -hmm. reason why, I mean, there, there, there's a reason why it was Steve Harris's favorite rock band. Right. It, it was a rock band, you yeah. know what I mean? It wasn't, uh, it, it, it had all the fucking proper elements that, that, that dirty rock is all about, right. you know? And that's what, that's immediately, first listen, it's like, this is fucking cool. This, this, this is stuff I dig. You know, real. Well, I have a funny story about you joining Thin Lizzy that I wasn't sure I would ever tell you. All right. Because when that whole thing started to tour again, I used to get on my soapbox and say, that should never fucking happen. That band should not be on the road. Blah, blah, blah. And I mean, for those few years that they were doing it, I would every once in a while would come up and I get on my soapbox. And I'm like, that's fucking bullshit. Blah, blah. Very adamant about it. So one night I'm getting into bed and my wife says, talked to Ricky lately? <laughs> and I go, that's eh, been a minute. Why? She goes, she give him a call. And I and I go, why? She goes, just give him a call. And I, and I obviously, she's my wife, so I'm like, okay, what's up? She goes, you got a new job. And I'm like, oh, good for him. What is it? She goes, why don't you ask him? And I'm like, I am just being set up here, you know? So I'm like, I'm like, just fucking tell me. And she goes, join Thin Lizzy. And I was like, uh oh, how do I react? Yeah. You know, because I'm yeah. stoked for you that yeah. you're doing it sure. and it's something you want to do. But then I've been like the dude on the soapbox for oh, four yeah. years going, fuck that, yeah. this should never happen. So then I thought about it for a couple days and I, it was right before your birthday. Yeah, that's right. And, up, and yeah. you had texted me or emailed me about going to the bar that used to be around the corner yeah. from your house. So I just responded with, yeah, we'll be there. I hear the boys are back in town. And that was it. And so I was like, you know, so this whole time that you were in, in Thin Lizzy and now Black Star Riders, I've been like, he'll get it. He'll think it's funny. But. So, so Lizzie's on, on tour with Guns N' Roses. Uh, and there, there was this just this, this, this purity, this beauty, like walking down the hall and seeing the, 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 the dressing room signs and all this kind of shit. And, and seeing my friend like stumble out of Axel's dressing room with <laughs> bottles of wine. This is great! <laughs> you know, and, and it was great. It's hard for people to wrap their heads around Twisted Sister or something other than the, the MTV Twisted Sister. But there was a time when Twisted Sister were to the East Coast when a band like Guns N' Roses worked out here. They were the unifying voice of like disenchanted, ugly rockers, okay? You would go there and they would do their half originals which was like shoot them down and under the blade not we're not going to take it or any of that stuff along with uh rainbows long live rock and roll or acdc sin city so it was this cool thing with these massive transvestites playing too loud <laughs> rock and roll and disco fucking sucks and that's yeah and and i mean that band got so big they sold out the palladium and had to be signed. It's not because people wanted to sign them, it's because the, there was a demand for it, which is similar to what happens with Guns N' Roses. People would come out and listen to the band, and I don't get it, they're too loud, it's too fucking, you know, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? There's a thousand kids to see the, the early show, the 10 o'clock show, and there's a thousand kids to see the late show, the midnight show, you know? So there's when you say some, people, you mean industry people? Industry people, right. you know, they see the, 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 this this rock and roll blight. They see this 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 scar that they can't understand its appeal. So, but the point I, I was trying to make was East Coast original bands were were pretty much cover bands. You know, there was a lot of cover bands, not in like the tribute sense, but you know, they would go out, they'd do a UFO song, they'd go out, they'd do. A, uh, a Deep Purple song, an Aerosmith song, yada yada yada, and that's what that's what a young struggling band was like. Then you come out to Los Angeles, and 
bands are playing their own material and, and it was really like eye-opening like wow th there there's creativity going on here some of it's really bad some of it's fucking great and uh and and the first people who I happen to meet, this the, the you know just just stumble into their lives and become friends with are 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 the the guys from Guns N' Roses, and in you know we're talking and bullshitting and and being young men posturing and all that kind of stuff, where uh, you know how many times have you been arrested? You know how many drugs have you taken? How many times have you gotten laid? And all that kind of you know. 22 year old insecure Absolutely. stuff but their name Guns N' Roses just grabbed it's like wow if you're half as cool as your fucking yeah. name and then I saw them a month later after hanging out and it was that Aerosmith at Max's Kansas City or, or, or seeing The Clash you know like holy fuck there's really something great going on here you know Absolutely. I always I agree. To us here in LA, being basically fans, they already seemed like what they were going to become. Mm -hmm. They were already, yeah, you'd see cool. them out yeah, in absolutely. bars and stuff and yeah. be like, oh, there's actually, there's yeah. They're rock stars. There's this, yeah. They were fucking yeah. rock stars. Yeah. And it just, no, everyone else joined. Yeah.